Hello, I'm Kave Madani, a senior fellow at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. Um, today, we have another episode of um, Iran's Contemporary Forum, in which uh, we talk to two of my colleagues on the subject of um, medical practices, COVID-19, and what's happening in Iran and um, in the United States in dealing with this pandemic. Now I'd like to ask our guests to introduce themselves. Hello there, and uh, good day and uh, good night, depending on where you are on the globe. Uh, my name is uh, Vaid Mosinin. I'm a professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine in New Haven, uh, Connecticut. My specialty is uh, pulmonary and critical care diseases. I'm glad to be here as I'm part of this uh, uh, session. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I am Asghar Asghar, Professor of Medicine. I am a nephrologist by training. I really spend most of my time directing global health program, uh, focusing on a resource limited environment, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. But having also taught in Iran for a decade, I continue to travel to Iran, be very interested in events going on in Iran. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. It's great uh, to have you both uh, on the show. Um, so, Dr. Mosenin, let me start with you. We have had pandemics before. Uh, we are hearing more and more about coronavirus, but we have had pandemic be pandemics before, even in, in, in modern times. Why is this one so different? Yes, uh, this is uh, quite special. Uh, this is, that's what it's called, novel. Uh, COVID uh, or uh, coronavirus. Coronavirus is not new to us as uh, humans. Uh, about one third of all uh, flus, uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, cold are related to uh, coronavirus. And those are more of an endemic forms of corona, but uh, corona uh, V2, which is this particular uh, strain of corona is very special. Humans never been exposed to this. It was transmitted from bats um, through some intermediate uh, host. Uh, and here, here it is. Uh, this is the, uh, the corona uh, cartoon. Uh, shows all these spikes that are the keys to the entrance into the lungs uh, of humans. And uh, the origin is from uh, bats. Uh, and then the intermediate hosts uh, are, are several animal uh, species. The very first corona in an endemic form was back in 2020, and that was uh, transmitted um, through uh, uh, animals in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's called uh, SARS, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, in southern China in 2002. The global mortality at the time was uh, a little bit less than a thousand uh, individuals. Then in 2012, about eight years ago, another coronavirus jumped or hopped over to camels, and that spread that to humans, uh, primarily in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And the overall global uh, uh, death rate was uh, close to 900. And then in 2019, another novel uh, coronavirus uh, was transmitted to humans, uh, most likely uh, directly from bats in these uh, uh, wet uh, animal uh, markets in South China, which is called SARS-CoV-2, which is a very special and novel uh, type. And unfortunately, it has a very uh, strong virulence and infectivity can infect uh, individuals very rapidly, and then uh, human to human uh, transmission is also very high. Uh, for every one person, one person can infect uh, uh, three people. And so that's why we have such a fast uh, spread of the uh, virus across the globe. And now we're talking about over a million um, and changing on a daily basis. And there are others that uh, they're not known to be infecting uh, humans. So this is kind of a short story about how coronaviruses are being transmitted from animals to uh, to humans thank you thank you and and you know so the 
one of the variables you mentioned is is how many people one can one infected person can um, infect right? get infected right so is that the main reason for for this pandemic being so um, cruel to human beings or are there other factors of course the uh, uh, it is a very virulent uh, virus uh, with a high infectivity rate but the uh, settings for such a fast transmission and the spread is primarily the uh, de human density um, or, or uh, the population at the risk of developing and transmitting the virus. So the combination of the virus itself, which is quite virulent and active and has been very successful in uh, being able to reproduce itself. But the main issue that we're going to probably talk about is the uh, is the density of human population that are infected so they can easily infect others in the one to two, three time uh, uh, the ratio and that's been the problem and that's where the isolation self quarantine and social distancing uh, come into play because if you don't give the virus opportunity to go from one person to the next it's not going to last i see thank you dr rastagar um uh, why Iran? Why was Iran among the you know, first hit nations? And um, I assume that we have suffered from other pandemics also in the past, H1N1 and, and others. Uh, why this one got so out of control? Uh, the virulence of a, a pandemic is partly due to biological reason. The person of Sani mentioned some of them about this virus. But part of it is really a social and political structure of the place that we are talking about. In Iran, it happened because Iran has a very close uh, uh, economic relationship with China. There's a lot of back and forth with China. And number two, there are Chinese students who study uh, in Qom, religious, religious uh, capital of Iran. Uh, it's not clear what brought the virus to Iran, but it was either a commercial activity that did that, or it may have been a passenger, a Chinese student or an Iranian who had traveled to China that came. But it came to a place which is unique, where there are many travelers from Iran who go to home for religious reasons. The city is extremely crowded. Uh, there is obviously a shrine there that people go and pray. And it brings a large number of people in extremely close area where one person can pass the virus to many more in a very, very short time. Uh, the other reason is the fact that there were both political and religious reason to really, in a sense, mismanage uh, this whole epidemic. It's not clear when would the first patient was recognized was probably in the early to mid-February, but the first announcement was done on 19th of February uh, by uh, Dr. Namaki, Minister of Health. But on the 21st of February was the election, and the government was very interested to make sure that this event did not interfere with the election. So the whole thing was hushed for a period of time, allowing the virus to actually not only spread within Qom, but also allow travelers to travel back to their own city, some in Iran, some in the region, and some as far away as Canada, New Zealand, Germany, etc. So those couple of weeks in which everyone knew that the virus was there, but there was no public announcement and no attempt to actually deal with that uh, in, a, in a serious manner as was done in China, allowed the virus to really spread very rapidly through the population. So, so let, let me ask you an ignorant question, Dr. Mosinin, because, um, you know, so we, we guessed that the patient zero was, was in Iran, has, had appeared long before the announcement. But you're a doctor. I walk into your office and I have symptoms that you might not be, I don't know, familiar with. How do you know that, like, you know, if I'm walking into your office, and I'm, I'm affected with a new new virus. How do you detect that this is something different? So, so my question is about like how how 
prepared the medical system is for detection of a new virus? Is it the, the, the late announcement? Is it, is it because of late detection that the system was not alert, was not ready for, for a new thing? They were not aware of something happening around them in their environment? Or is it because it's just ignorance and, and they didn't realize or they had other purposes for not announcing it? If there is no uh, public announcement, so individuals, including physicians, and the healthcare systems are not aware of spread of such a virus. So a person walks in with the cold-like symptoms, they assume it's just a regular garden variety infection, and they will treat them as such. Um, and obviously, there's no treatment. It's just a supportive care until the public is aware of this pandemic and the doctors are also aware and, uh, and informed then the suspicion for uh, approaching these patients with a special precautions and, uh, and workup will be necessary at this point. But if people aren't, don't know about it, they don't know how to deal with it. And was this a reason that, that many countries you know, had a delay in, in responding to it or taking it seriously, including the United States? I believe uh, that uh, it, at the initial part of this, uh, people thought that this is going to be another short-lived uh, spread of a virus and it's gonna go away. And um, so they underestimated the, the gravity uh, that this uh, virus can cause and the, and the rapidity by which it can spread. So I think part of that was that kind of the inertia of moving forward because of underestimating the, uh, the, the magnitude of this problem. Thank you. Dr. Asabar, I assume you are interacting with, with people in Iran. Uh, we hear a lot about mismanagement and that like Iran could have done better and, and you know that they they must have announced it earlier. They they should have taken it more seriously. You know, let's put those aside. I mean, first tell us like if, if Iran was not one of the first hit nations, would have the same thing happened to Iran later on? Could it could have been one of the later victims? Did Iran really have a role in making this a pandemic, making it global? Because in the early days, a lot of people were blaming Iran for, for making this a global thing. But then when it happened to Italy and other countries, the stories changed a little bit. But, but also, I want to know about inside hospitals, something that we don't hear much about. Like, you know, yes, we hear that there's a lack of equipment, sanctions, all these things that we hear. But Okay, doctors are doctors and they're practicing. And, and in every country, I assume they use their, you know, their, what they have available to, to cure their patients, regardless of which system they're working for and what the political um, motives are of the system and so on. Well, at present time, uh, I think 200 countries uh, have been uh, dealing with this disease. Uh, it is true that Iran in the Middle East became a center uh, for the spread of the disease, but the disease was going to spread anyway all over the world. Iran did send a patient to uh, New Zealand, but New Zealand is doing extremely well. Iran is not responsible for what happened in Italy, and Italy did very poorly. So I think the virus will cross borders one way or the other. You could blame China, you could blame Iran, you could blame Italy, but that doesn't get us anywhere. The virus is going to cross all borders. Sorry to the interrupt, is, even, even the story of Rome. So if, if it had not started in Rome, you know, you know, we could have started in Ahwaz or, or Zahedan exactly. or, or Tehran. It could have been a merchant in Isfahan, and it could have been spreading beginning in Isfahan. The uh, uniqueness to a platform. Uh, as there's a uniqueness to a place called New York uh, that has different abilities in terms of dealing with the epidemic, but it was going to happen no matter what. So then the question will come, is the country prepared to deal with the epidemic? It has a fairly strong both public health and therapeutic health system. Uh, you know, it dealt with the total epidemic in 1965. Uh, and uh, a cholera epidemic that crossed in Iran and Pakistan quite well, in not only scientifically 
dealt with the epidemic in terms of treating patients. It also dealt with it in terms of public health, making sure it did not get up and become an epidemic in the country. In terms of uh, the health structure in Iran, it is a highly structured network that begins in a village to a small cities, to larger cities, and then to close up the provinces. And these are all managed through medical schools, which are which belong to each province. They are responsible to provide both public health as well as therapeutic health to the population. And that system actually Iran is quite strong and well managed. Now, when uh, COVID came to Iran, the delay of two or three weeks allowed to spread, especially to Gilan, to Tehran, to al Burj province, to Mashhad, to Khurasan Razavi, less to, for example, to Fars, and so on. The system, when they finally recognized that this was actually an epidemic, I took Iran to really close and respond to this in the middle of March, finally around the time of New Year, it was March 19th or so, that they closed the cities and they started a true quarantine in the cities. And then they began to deal with the disease, both at the public health level, but also at the hospital level. Now, while uh, there are problems at the higher level in Iran, in terms of mismanagement, I will also say corruption. Level of the hospital and the physicians, there are phenomenal high variants, uh, very creative care workers, both physicians, nurses, and others, who are able to actually deal with these issues fairly effectively, despite the sanction, despite lack of resources and all of that. An example, uh, in the major hospitals in Tehran University, uh, there have been a large number of patients that have been cared for, uh, who have come to the hospital. The mortality in that population has been only 7%. The mortality in New York City for one patient is somewhere around 25 to 30%. An article published in England two days ago in 16 England with 16,000 patients, the mortality was 33%. Now, the major reason for difference is actually the difference in mean age of the population. In Iran, the mean age of the patients is 52 years. In New York and England, it's closer to 72 years. So while it's not a claim that Iran has did better than they did in other countries. The seven person actually an outstanding outcome indicating presence of highly skilled individuals providing care. What worries everyone right now is when the quarantine was completed and now the government allows certain business to open, what will happen to Iran? It's actually interesting to compare the events in Rome to a place like Shiraz. Shiraz, people actually stayed in their homes. A picture of this it's on the 13th of Arvardi, a place where all the Shirazis would flood to the parks and to the boulevards, no matter what is happening. They were totally empty. The number of patients that made in Shiraz have been extremely low, the lowest in the country, and the mortality for their colleague works there has only been 2%, indicating that the system is able to take care of the patient if there's also public health means to limit the number of patients that flood the system and demand care at that time. So, so let, let me challenge you both on, on the numbers, on the statistics. How, how much can we trust the statistics coming out of Iran, China, Italy, the United States, or the rest of the world? If our capacity to test is limited, if, if there are manipulations, then if there is problem with detection, early detection, and so on. Dr. Mohsenin, do we trust the numbers? Can we really do these comparisons at this stage of the game? Uh, so, so let me actually get back to the, uh, the spread of the virus. Um, I don't think it helps to kind of blame any particular country. The major driver for uh, the spread is the human and population mobility and global travel. 
And if you look at the uh, genomic footprints of the virus, you can see that it obviously started in China and uh, spread through China. And then because of the global travel and um, uh, to Europe and um, uh, Western um, uh, United States, actually the travel basically transmitted the disease. Um, Seattle, California, and then New York, which is a major hub for international uh, trade and travel. So it's the travel and mobility of population that led to this uh, global spread in a matter of two months. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether uh, was in, started in China or in Iran or in the United States. The, the fact that it spread was the travel and the global mobility. So now the answer, as far as the statistics, you cannot, I mean, what all we have is what has been diagnosed. If you don't have the testing, so you don't really don't know what the base of that statistic is. So unless you basically study and get enough samples and appropriate samples and run the proper testing, then you know what the prevalence or the, or the spread of the virus in the community is, and not just those that they're coming to the hospital. So what we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the um, experts, epidemiologists think that we are probably reporting a quarter of what's out there. So that at least there's fourfold uh, uh, increase in the number of the people who are infected. If you are talking about a million or over, there are at least four million out there that they're undiagnosed. Three million are undiagnosed and spreading. So statistics, they are what they are based on the the uh, assessment and the objective uh, test. Whether the reporting is accurate, who knows? Inside hospitals in New Haven, what is happening? Um, like you know good things and bad things like failures and success stories right we um we were the second wave when uh, new york uh, got hammered with uh, thousands of patients basically overburdening their healthcare system and then spill over to connecticut we were actually in the process of uh, preparing our hospitals uh, in the southern uh, part of connecticut be prepared for the onslaught of the virus. And uh, a lot of changes were made, strategic uh, changes in terms of number of uh, ventilators necessary, the number of ICU beds, anticipating more or less the same type of a uh, pressure like New York uh, was exerted upon. But we were quite successful in accommodating uh, patients coming through, screening, uh, quarantine, uh, what we call person under investigation that they were admitted and in isolation until they were proven positive or negative. And then if they were negative, they were discharged uh, to home and isolate themselves for two weeks to make sure. And those were positive, they were observed to see whether they're gonna overcome the problems or they get more complicated and they're requiring an intensive care unit uh, and the ventilators. So we've been quite actually happy and and content with what we have accomplished um, in our institution. How about the rest of the uh, United States? How do you evaluate the performance in other states like New York or or the system as a whole? That you know, we, you know, when it comes to Iran, it's easy to blame mismanagement, but but the United States also dismissed the the story early on. It's a very good question and very hard to answer because there is such a uh, non-homogeneity of healthcare system uh, across the United States that uh, that it's very hard to make a, a, a general statement as to how how uh, institutions are doing, uh, how towns are dealing with this. Uh, now we're seeing a second wave spreading into smaller towns and moving uh, into central uh, states and southern states, and they may not be as equipped as uh, the uh, West and the East Coasts. Um, so we just have to see. The time will tell. Um, Dr. Raskar, just very quick judgment of, um, what, uh, of what Iran has done, because we're running out of time. Um, positives and negatives. Um, and we are talking about inside hospitals, inside hospitals, physicians, nurses. What, what's incredible about their work and what could have they done better? What was incredible is the fact that they were able to go on to the crisis 
despite very limited resources. Uh, there were medical students who were making PPEs for a specific because of lack of resources so that the healthcare workers are not exposed uh, to the virus. There has been over 100 healthcare workers who have died in Iran, including many physicians who have died. That one has to do, really pay respect to the courage to go and work in an environment where support is much less than you see in New Haven and the United States. And despite all of that, they look as being their challenge and expectation of society to be protected by them. I think the major challenge that we are facing right now is what is going to happen now that the site is open for commercial activity? Talk to my colleagues in Tehran and Shiraz. There has only been a minimum increase in number of new patients being seen. And surprisingly, there are milder cases. It may be that older patients are staying away or they are obeying the rules of in much more than we had imagined. If you look at Tehran and Shiraz, it's now flooded with cars, individuals involved in that. So they learn will the healthcare system have the capability? to respond to a large number of patients suddenly appearing at their door. That's what their major concern is. The other concern obviously that they have is, as a new drug becomes available, will Iran be excluded? That US has behaved in my mind very badly, continued increasing sanction during this time, which in no sense undermined the government but certainly has impacted on the health of the population in Iran. So I'd like to give credit to my colleagues in Iran while recognizing that there was mismanagement at a higher level in Iran in dealing with this event. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asagar. Thank you, Dr. Mohsen. Um, I assume that the, the challenge that you, you, you mentioned is the challenge everywhere. Eventually, we have to let people out of lockdown because economies cannot survive like this. Of course, those countries whose economies are under pressure can't do less for their people, and Iran is no exception. I hope this discussion has been useful um, to you. Uh, thank you so much.